This past summer, I read Catherine Gilbiner's autobiography, Good Morning Monster. In it, she shares five extraordinary stories of emotional recovery realized through extensive psychotherapy. One of these stories follows Danny, a man part of the Cree indigenous tribe in rural Canada. He came into Gilderner's office seeking help to mourn his daughter and wife, who tragically died in a car accident. Shockingly, Danny had not shed a single tear for his loved ones and had returned to work immediately. Gildener worked through his childhood to remedy his physiological trauma. In 1958, at the age of five or six years old, Danny and his older sister were taken away from their home by government agents who placed them in a residential school a thousand kilometers away. This residential school formed part of a network of boarding schools across Canada that housed indigenous children funded by the Canadian government and administered by Christian churches. The Canadian government wanted to acquire indigenous land and resources while assimilating indigenous people into their society. At these residential schools, the children of the tribes were forced to submit to Western culture. Danny's name was taken from him. He was labeled number 78. He was isolated from his sister for days after being placed in the camp until one day he saw his sister across the fence during recess. He ran to her, banged on the fence repeatedly, and screamed the word Dainzi. Dainzi means hello in Cree, his native language. He was immediately beaten for this, placed in solitary confinement, and eventually repeatedly sexually abused by a priest. Every aspect of Danny's identity was taken from him. He was told his Cree culture was bad and immoral. He became so detached from his identity fully depersonalized, that when in confession, he confessed to being Native. No matter the economic gain the Canadian government would face trampling over thousands of cultures of Native populations, this utter violence towards children is unthinkable to me. However, it is not uncommon to see powerful people abuse their power to exert dominance over those they deem inferior. I'm forced to think about dating how this deeply rooted depersonalization and internalized racism permanently altered his identity. The social environmental effects of being in a residential school changed Danny, perhaps even on a biological level. In my attempt to understand the extent to which Danny's environment changed him, and specifically to understand if it changed him biologically, I came across a field of epigenetics. Epigenetics, in simple terms, is the study of how our behaviors and environment can cause changes that affect the way our genes function. Healthy bodies have many types of functioning cells. Some are brain cells, skin cells, white blood cells, etc. What makes, say, liver cells different from brain cells is not the DNA itself, rather the different parts of the DNA that are turned on or off. These different parts are called genes. Epigenetics controls when each of the many genes we have turn on or off. Significantly, our life experiences create epigenetic marks. If a mark instructs a cell to ignore any gene in the DNA segment it is attached to, that gene will be turned off. This will prevent the DNA from producing the proteins coded by that specific gene. I want to take us through a study performed by researchers at McGill University titled Lick your rocks. This study aimed to demonstrate how epigenetic changes manifest between high and low nurture rats. Some mom rats lick, groom, and nurse their pup rats a lot. Some other, pup rat, some other mom rats ignore their pup rats more often than not. It has been proven that the pup rats who receive lots of licking from their mother rats grow up to be calm adult rats while well, the pup rats who lacked nursing from the mother rats grew up to be anxious adult rats. In a situation of danger, the adrenaline-driven flight-or-flight response is triggered, and the hormone cortisol will be released into the bloodstream, much like in humans. Cortisol can help 
the rats avert those situations of danger by either fleeing or fighting, but too much of it can cause depression, heart disease, among other things. This hormone will also travel to the hippocampus in the brain, where it will bind to the glucorticoid receptor genes, which we can refer to as GRs. Rats with high levels of GR can better detect cortisol. This means they can handle situations of stress better. It has been proven that the calm adult rats receive lots of care from their mother rats express a lot of GRs, meaning they are better fit to handle stressful situations. Meanwhile, the anxious adult rats express less GRs, meaning they are biologically less apt at handling stress. Researchers at McGill found that GRs are not the only genes affected by the, pup rat, the licking the pup rats receive. In fact, there are hundreds of genes that are expressed differently. On a human level, changes to our epigenome influenced by the environment can make us more or less apt to rise to challenges in our lives. The curious and unique thing about epigenetics is that they can be reversed because they do not change our DNA itself Rather, it changes how our bodies read DNA. Moreover, epigenetics can be passed on to offspring. They act as the mechanism through which the effects of childhood trauma, malnutrition, and poverty can last a lifetime and manifest through the lifetime of generations to come as well. So now we understand that Danny's environment changed his epigenome and that such changes could be passed on through generations. What made Danny's environment so difficult to live in was the imposition of Western culture on the indigenous peoples. We have seen this imposition of Western culture before. For example, in European, American, and Canadian quests for colonization. A hunger for land, resources, and economic gain drove ethnic cleansing back then. But what justified it? Let's talk about social Darwinism. Social Darwinism is a theory that emerged in the late 1880s as a product of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's theory states, only the plants, animals, best adapted to their environments will be able to reproduce, survive, and reproduce to transfer their genes to generations to come. Poorly adapted plants and animals will not survive to reproduce. Darwin's theory was widely accepted and celebrated by the scientists and behaviorists of the time. Survival of the fittest was used to popularize his theory. At the time, people from Western countries had already developed a superiority complex because they believed that they, the fit, possessed characteristics like industriousness and the ability to create wealth while those they considered below them, the unfit, were innately lazy and stupid. Furthermore, who was fit and unfit was determined on the basis of race. Social Darwinism claimed to hold scientific proof of the inferiority of races. However, there is no scientific evidence supporting the concept of human races on a biological level at all. The Human Genome Project of 2003 confirmed that all human beings are 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level after extensive research on the Homo sapiens species and our direct ancestors. There is no genetic basis for race. Thus, we can discredit social Darwinism as a pseudoscientific theory serving as justification for colonialism and imperialism. Stemming from social Darwinism came the more extremist study of eugenics. The word eugenics is derived from the Greek word eugenes, which means good at birth. Eugenics is the immoral, pseudoscientific study that claims that perfecting people and groups through the scientific laws of inheritance and genetics is possible. Darwin's theories combined with those of Gregor Mendel's who is a scientist whose work focused on the scientific laws of inheritance, served as a platform to rationalize racial improvement. Racial improvement was carried out through social engineering, like marriage prohibitions, forced sterilizations, and encouraged abortions. So now we know about social Darwinism, and 
the powerful role of epigenetics in transgenerational DNA changes. What is the correlation between these two things? What does this have to do with DNA we talked about at the beginning of this conversation? I have come up with a hypothesis you are more than welcome to reject, or maybe think about as you move through the rest of your day. Social Darwinism claims that the superiority of Western people on the account of false biology. This false, inherently racist, 18th century theory gave birth to widespread systems of colonialism that unintentionally perpetuated negative genetic variations in oppressed people and their descendants today. Colonialism, imperialism, and ethnic cleansing biologically disfavored generations of oppressed people, leaving them prone to genetic psychological disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorder. Colonialism has a direct psychic effect. Colonialism hijacked the sense of self of the colonized. Their psyches were permanently occupied by the colonizer. Therefore, colonialism was the breeding ground for mental disorders, among them, and very prominent today, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a mental disorder that is developed after experiencing or seeing a terrifying event. It comes with strong emotional and physical sensations that can take the form of reliving the traumatic event through thoughts, dreams, and flashbacks. It can also trigger emotional numbness and alterations in mood and cognition. A person with PTSD has a heightened sense of awareness so as to avoid any event like the traumatic one they experience. On a more biological level, people with PTSD exhibit different gene expressions and levels of DNA methylation. DNA methylation is a process by which molecules are added to our DNA to create epigenetic marks. Children whose mothers were diagnosed with PTSD while in utero are prone to psychiatric disorders. This is because of an increase in the promoter activities of the glucorticoid receptor genes, which we mentioned earlier when talking about the epigenetics and corporates and the stress circuit. So what about Danny's daughter? What about the descendants of thousands of indigenous peoples who have been persecuted for centuries? They, I found, are prone to intergenerational PTSD and other mental disorders compared to non-indigenous populations. In a 2008 review performed by the researchers at the University of Northern British Columbia, it was concluded that there is a strong relationship between intergenerational PTSD and other mental disorders and epigenetics in transgenerational trauma. Through the 2008 to 2010 First, Na First Nations Regional Longitudinal Health Survey, also known as the RHS, it was found that 31.4% of Native youth who had at least one parent attend a residential camp reported symptoms of depression, compared to 20.4% of those children who had neither parent attend a residential camp. The RHS also found that 37.2% of adults who had at least one parent attend a residential camp thought about committing suicide in their lifetime, compared to 25.2% of those who had neither parent attend a residential camp. The ethnic cleansing of indigenous people in North America and countless other events of mass violence and oppression have biologically changed the descendants of these respective communities the children, grandchildren, and future generations of oppressed people are now prone to intergenerational PTSD and other mental disorders their colonizers and oppressors are not vulnerable to. Social Darwinism had a causal impact in the genetic disfavoring of, oppressed, of descendants of oppressed non-Western people today. Our sci the science behind epigenetics supports this argue argument. However, we also know that epigenetic changes are reversible. With modern research on psychotherapy and the effective ways to reverse these epigenetic changes and end the trauma these descendants are experiencing, 
maybe, perhaps one day in the future, we can correct the effects of stark, deep-seated racism and genocide influenced by social Darwinism. Thank you.